Welcome back, bug nerds. Uh, this video just popped up into my feed and I figured I could do a reaction. Uh, just to start off, just off of this uh, still here, the beetle isn't, hasn't been identified yet, but just from looking at it, these mites, uh, these mites are called phoretic mites. Uh, and the phenomenon is called foracy. And basically this is a um, kind of commensalate symbiosis sort of thing where one animal will use a larger animal as a taxi service, basically. Yeah, and you can kind of tell that this isn't parasitism, that this is in fact just a benign sort of uh, relationship because one um, of where these mites are located, generally speaking, parasites will congregate onto softer parts of insects. So they'll be on like joints of the legs or uh, soft parts around the around the mouth, around the eyes, or anywhere where there's like a membrane that they can get their mouth parts into. Whereas with these mites, they're just kind of scattered all over the place. And they're just kind of holding on to any uh, edges or hairs that are available. There's no point on feeding on the pronotum or the elytra or anything like that. It's, it's rock hard, there's no blood flow there. Uh, so these aren't parasites. And two, generally with parasites, you don't have this many. If a, a beetle of this size had this many uh, blood-sucking parasites on it of this size, they would be dead really, really fast. And foracy ha happens a lot in animals, but it's extremely common in mites because mites don't really have any other means of dispersing because they're so small and slow and they don't have wings. Uh, some mites will have a specific life stage in which they are adapted to foracy and really adapted to cling to the host insect. In bees, some phoretic mites will have a secondary life stage where they grow ab uh, abnormally long limbs in order to hold on to the bee better. And this kind of foracy is also in other animals. It's how snails get from pond to pond. Uh, because snails are so slow, they would die before being able to crawl between bodies of water. So instead, they just attach themselves to the feet of ducks and wait for the ducks to fly to another lake. So with that, let's get into this video. Why is this dead mouse moving? Well, death? Well, I mean, it could be full of maggots, but I think I saw something underneath it. So some, I, that must be a, the large beetle. Is a magnet for life. And there's something down there. It's a yellow belly burying beetle hustling to hide this mouse before saying. Okay, so it's a burying beetle. So, burying beetles, uh, when I learned them, they were their own family, or, or these were called carrion beetles. Uh, they were called the sylphids. Now they're not. They're in a different group. But in nature, generally, they're they find like dead birds or rats or any sorts of uh, medium to large size uh, dead animals, and they will attempt to either bury them or bury a chunk of them in order to reproduce on them. So this is kind of like how dung beetles will bury animal dung in order uh, to use that uh, feces as um, a food source for their young. The bearing beetles do that, but with flesh. But what's cool about the bearing beetles is that there's one particular uh, bearing beetle, Nicrophorus americanus, which is the American bearing beetle. And it was the first insect to ever be put on the endangered species list. Um, and it's found, I believe, in like Oklahoma and Nebraska, places like that. But it's extremely rare now, uh, probably from loss of habitat. But these uh, are very important insects for sort of recycling in the environment, just like the dung beetles are. Say a raccoon gets it. It also has to work faster than these ants, which are here for bits of mouse to feed their larvae. And there's this fly too, looking for a place to lay her eggs. More on that later. Over the next few hours, it digs up dirt from below the mouse. It pushes and pulls. Yes, that is just one beetle doing the hauling. That's really surprising. I didn't know that, that it's just one beetle. I kind of figured it was it would be multiple beetles, kind of like uh, the dung beetles that will find a mate and then move the, a large ball of dung together. I didn't realize that one beetle could move a mouse. That seems kind of crazy. Maybe the mouse is lighter because it's dead and it's losing fluid. I don't know. That's crazy. Moving that carcass safely underground. 
This carcass is about to become a nursery and a buffet. Underground, they roll the carcass into a ball. This reduces the amount of flesh exposed to bacteria and decay. That's one way to bond on a date. The mouse takes on the So you could already see some of those phoretic mites on the carcass. So they likely came in with the adult. Um, so the nice thing about being a, a phoretically inclined animal is if you have a close relationship with a host that also feeds on the same things that you feed on, um, you could just hang out with them and they'll shuttle you from place to place. Color of dirt. The beetles dab the ball with microbes from their butts that work like a preservative, slowing down the rotting. The meal has to keep so they can feed their offspring. See that? A few days later, larvae hatch from the eggs mom laid right next to the carcass. They're hungry, and mom feeds them bits of pre-chewed mouse into their... So this is actually pretty rare with the beetles. Uh, not so much, uh, you know, admit, getting food for your young and supplying them with food. A lot of insects do that, where they will... Um, supply a nest with food, but most insects will just get the food, lay the eggs, and leave. So things like this where you have parental care of an insect, that is not super common. The only one that's coming to the uh, coming to my head right off the bat that does this are the best beetles, the pasalids. They do uh, care for young. Um, they're uh, sometimes called the patent leather beetles. They're very large and you'll find them in rotting wood and they will they do have some level of communication and parental care but generally speaking with insects uh you, unless it is a social insect you don't see this sort of level of parental care their mouths when they're big enough the larvae crawl right into that pantry and help themselves it's a party in here Meanwhile, some other creatures are also flourishing on this mouse carcass. Mites that rode in on the beetles. They're okay, so I was right. So these mites, oh, there they are right there. These mites came in with the adult beetle. They were, uh, and because the beetle is going to their food source anyway, they share they share an environment, the, um, the beetle just brings it in. They're called phoretic, which means they're piggybackers. They reproduce like mad and look like a huge nuisance to their carriers. What, do I have something on my face? But the mites actually help the beetles. Remember the fly that laid her eggs on the carcass? Well, the mites devour fly eggs, which would otherwise grow into maggots hungry for this delicacy. The mites also eat a few beetles. So this is really beneficial to the beetles because the beetles tend to develop slower than uh, flies do. Flies generally reproduce really, really quick. They tend to lay a lot of eggs and they tend to reach adulthood really, really fast. So they would devour all of the carrion before the more slowly developing beetles uh, could finish their life cycle. Beetle eggs from time to time. It's the price the beetles pay so their larvae have the mouse to themselves. But if a beetle family is large, a carcass sometimes isn't enough to feed all the hungry mouths. So mom gets rid of a few of her larvae by eating them. She so even this level of parental care is really, really rare in the insect world, where the adult is actually not only staying with their young, but actually judging the food supplies and then making a decision, okay, I have to kill some of my offspring in order to make the food supply last an adequate amount of time. This is a very unusual behavior. He eats some so that others can thrive. Continuing that strange dance between life and death. So this was a really cool uh, series. I'll have to look into more of these uh, videos put out by PBS. Everything there was fact seemed to be factually correct. Um, and just really well done. And uh, you guys should check out these PBS Deeper Looks. Talk to you guys later.